This episode is sponsored by LEP Premium. Gain access to over 70 episodes of content, both audio and video, all written and presented by me to help you improve your English. I've got vocabulary lessons, I've got grammar lessons, I've got pronunciation lessons. There are PDFs to download or check in your phone. It's all available in the Luke's English Podcast app. To get started, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium and you can send me an email if you have any questions. It's the price of a cup of coffee every month, about three or four dollars. And then you get access to everything that I've done so far, plus all the new stuff online, at a computer, or through the Luke's English Podcast app. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this podcast for learners of English. And here is your regular dose of English conversation presented here to help you develop your listening skills and pick up grammar and vocabulary along the way. In this episode of the podcast, you can listen to me in conversation with Ian Moore, who is back on the podcast after a three and a half year absence. He first appeared in episodes 382 and 383 when we got to know him and talked about mod culture in the UK. If you haven't heard those episodes or if you have heard them and you need me to jog your memory, here is some background information about Ian just to bring you up to speed. So Ian Moore is a professional stand-up comedian from England. He moved around during his upbringing and is from a combination of places, including the North, East Anglia and the London area, as you'll hear during the conversation. He's been described by the Guardian newspaper as one of the country's top comedians, and he regularly performs in the best stand-up comedy venues all around the UK, notably at London's top stand-up comedy club, The Comedy Store, which is just off Leicester Square, where he is a frequent host. So Ian is a mod Mod is a British fashion subculture from the 1960s, which involves a very particular style featuring certain clothing, like, for example, slim Italian suits, green Parker coats, and a lot more besides, riding scooters and listening to American R&B music. Ian is definitely the best dressed guest I've ever had on this podcast, and he came dressed in a three-piece 60s Italian suit, gold watch chain, handkerchief in the pocket with a pin and everything. Ian now lives in rural France on a farm and he's been living there for nearly 15 years, which is at odds with his mod lifestyle. So he's been living a kind of double life, living on the farm in the French countryside, looking after various animals because his wife keeps introducing new animals into the family, making chutney and commuting to the UK and other cities in Europe to perform stand-up comedy. He's written several books about his double life, which are available from all good bookshops, including Amazon. And that the first one is called A la Mod, My So-Called Tranquil Family Life in Rural France. And the second one is called C'est Modnifique, Adventures of an English Grump in Rural France. So as well as writing these funny autobiographical stories, Ian has also branched out into writing fiction and his first novel called Playing the Martyr was published a couple of years ago. It's a crime thriller about an English man who gets murdered in the Loire Valley in France. Now I don't know if this is based on Ian's life at all. I've got no idea if there have been attempts on his life for some reason. But anyway... The book is well-reviewed on Amazon and is available in both Kindle and paperback versions. Ian is also a language learner, French in this instance. He actively works on his French and uh, he passed the language test to gain citizenship in France. So there are plenty of things to talk about. All of that is just background context. And if you'd like to know more, listen to episodes 382 and 383, both of which have transcripts written by the Orion transcript team available in Google Documents. So check the transcript section of my website to find those. So basically in those episodes, you can hear a full explanation of the mod subculture, including the clothes, the music and everything else. Uh, Various stories of Ian's rural French lifestyle, including how his 
Children were once threatened, rather shockingly, by a French hunter armed with a shotgun and other stories. So anyway, this time I decided to see where the conversation takes us and the result was an extremely tangential and rambling conversation that takes in such things as Ian's favourite films, Ian's recent trip to New York where he did comedy and spent time as a tourist, the complications of Woody Allen's current public image, differences between British and American audiences, differences between burlesque and stripping, Ian's different accents as a child moving from Blackburn to Norfolk to London, details of Ian's clothing, how to iron a shirt properly, which is a lesson that apparently I need to learn, Ian's various health issues and physical complaints and what might be causing them, comedy shows that you can see at the Comedy Store in London, and then Ian's stories about learning French and attempting to pass the language test for French citizenship. So watch out for various little jokes and funny stories along the way, and try to keep up as the topic of the conversation veers from one thing to another. But now, let's listen to my conversation with Ian Moore, and here we go. The Aristocats. You're saying that uh, being up here in... On the Paris rooftops yeah. is, is the Aristocats, isn't it? The, the, Dis- the Disney film. I'm not talking about the filthy American pseudo-documentary. I'm talking about the Disney film. The Aristocats. It's very much where I am more in my comedy. <laughs> I'm down the Disney end of comedy at the moment rather than the Aristocrats. I, I, you know, I've never seen the Aristocats. Um, can you remind us what, what It's happens? a wonderful film. The one, I think the cat gets, the kittens get separated from the mum, or the mum and the kittens get separated from their owner and they meet an alley cat. But it's set, it, first of all, it's set in Paris. It's that's set the in thing. Paris, yeah. as all cat films are. All cat films should all be set in Paris. Any good cat films. Any good cat films. I'm trying to think of another cat film that's set in Paris. But it's, it's great music as well. I'll tell you what, sorry, there's, there, there is another film, a Disney film set in Paris, but it's not Ratatouille. cats. Ratatouille. There was a cat involved though. Is there a cat in Ratatouille? And wasn't... Oh, no, that was Basil, the great marriage detective, was set in London. There was a cat in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, Ratatouille was the other Paris film. Yes. It's, it's in my... Sta- I've got this in my stand-up, actually. The, 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 the Hollywood versions of Paris. Or there's Sherrod, which is my favourite film. And Sh- it's not Disney. Sherrod? Sherrod. And that's a film... Uh, Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn, Walter Matthau, James Coburn... Ooh. Set in Paris in 1962, and it's absolutely superb. It's the best film Hitchcock never made. It's a very Hitchcock style film, mm-hmm. and I absolutely adore it. And I watch it possibly twice a week. What? <laughs> I know, I know that sounds really get out of town ridiculous. But every time, say if I finish a gig or I'm up late at night, and I go, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to watch something now, rather than stand around drinking my wine, I need to sit down so I'll go to bed earlier. Yeah. And I put on Sherrod every time. I've got it on my iPod, on my laptop, on my hard drive. I've got it, two DVD versions. What is it about the film Sherrod that... Just sheer class and the world that doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's, got, it's brilliant writing. It's, it's the two of my favourite actors, uh, well, four of my favourite actors. Um, a fantastic score. It's directed by Stanley Donan, who also directed Singing in the Rain. It has got everything. Songs? It's, uh, no, it's just it's just a theme song, just a, just a soundtrack. But there's a there's a kind of for me, it kind of represents the end of the golden age of Hollywood. I'm a huge fan of the golden age of Hollywood from the start of talkies until what I as charade is basically or charade, whichever way you want to. Yeah. I don't care. It's my favourite film. I'll pronounce it how I want. <laughs> <laughs> so from the start of talkies until charade, talkies, yeah. You'll have to explain what that. Well, means. when sound came into film, 1927, Al Jolson standing there going, "No, oh, wait, wait, wait! You ain't heard nothing yet." Wait a minute! Wait a minute! You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute! I tell you, you ain't heard nothing. That was the first sound heard on film. So that's the start of talking pictures. Mm. And so I, my favourite period of Hollywood is the start of talking pictures Talk- until Sherrod. Okay. Wow. By so the way, 27 to 62. As we go through this conversation, it may be necessary to explain and define as we go. Hollywood is, is a place in America. America is a big country <laughs> full of crazy the great people. Great Satan. <laughs> the great, some of you know it as the Great Satan, and you may be right. Well, I've just been there, and I was shocked. I, I, I'd been to New York. I'd never been to New York, and the reason why I went... 
um, was basically I booked a holiday because my wife and kids was constantly going on holiday and leaving me alone to look after our stupid zoo. Um, Wait, you, you, all the animals you've got? All the animals. We the current count 14. 14? Yeah, but I've been away two days. That may have changed. It may have multiplied. <laughs> you, you just never know. Biggest you animal? Never, biggest animal is the horse. Okay. And she's when she's around, when she wants to get, you know, fruity, I believe, is it, she wants to pin me up against a stable wall. Really? And it was, it was... Well, you feel frightened anyway because these are big animals. There's nothing you can do. You can't push a horse. Well, you can try. Yeah. But she had me pinned. She just needed some affection of some kind. She, she pinned you to the pinned wall me against of, the wall of the stable. Of the stable. Yeah. Like, what, pinned you to the wall. Yeah. So I couldn't move. I couldn't. Right. I couldn't. She was standing in a way and pressing herself up against me. And it was. It must have looked a right sight when I eventually did escape because I just emptied the chicken coop and I had. I had eggs. In my pocket, oh no, which had burst, <laughs> left left these horrible stains all over my coat. So it was a very odd, a weird sort of uh, almost romantic encounter with your it horse. Felt, it felt like it, it felt romantic. And you had in to a clean way. yourself up uh, afterwards. You had to, you know, Kleenex. Yes, yeah. it was a lot of yeah. There's a lot of that involved. So it. wait a minute. So your your family left you alone. They left me. They've been constantly leaving me alone for the last two years. Um, going off on going holiday. on holiday. Going on holiday. Um, well, I say on holiday. They're going to stay with uh, with my sister in law, who lives down by the Pyrenees, uh, or they go to England and see uh, grandparents and so on. Anyway, I'd had enough. I'd had enough of being left on my own, and I booked uh, a break in New York just for me, just for me. Mm. And I said right. Sodger, I'm going. Uh, you're going to have to look after your own animals for a week. What, what made you choose New York then? <sighs> because I'd never been. I'd never been to New York before. I'd, I'd been to America. I've gigged in America before, but I'd always wanted to go to New York. When I, a lot of my um, comedy roots, I would guess, would be Woody Allen, which I know is not a very fashionable thing to say, but regarding the fact that he's clearly in some ways a wrong one, um, what do you mean? Well, wrong, I mean, just that, that, that he is regarded as a pariah, I guess, in Hollywood circles because of two things. One, he married his stepdaughter, which is um, there's certainly grey area involved. In I mean, that. Actually, when you think about it, there's nothing really wrong with it because they're not. It wasn't illegal. He's not marrying his daughter. No. He's marrying his it's, it's stepdaughter. Not, it's not illegal, but there are some moral issues there that I think probably get forgotten. And also there's the thing about him, uh, the ongoing thing about him um, allegedly uh, abusing his daughter or stepdaughter. Yeah, there's now allegations of sexual misconduct. Which have been investigated twice. Yeah. Uh, and both times the police have said there's no case to answer, but that... It's still ongoing. Any, my point being mm-hmm. that Woody Allen is regarded as a pariah. So when you say you're a Woody Allen fan, that has baggage with it. Yeah. It has baggage with it. And, and I admit, even as, as an ardent Woody Allen fan, you can watch some Woody Allen films and there are elements of them where you cringe and go, in the light of what we know now, that, <laughs> that doesn't work, really. There's, I can't remember which film it is, but there's one film, I think from the 90s, where he is knocking around with a little girl for most of the film and it's all a bit weird. Well, there's Manhattan in one of his most famous films where he's basically in his 40s and chasing after a 17-year-old. Oh, yeah? So there is, <laughs> there's a lot of it. There's, there are, but, I mean, it's all very easy to look back in hindsight and say things like that. Uh, you yeah. know, you could... But, there are things there which do make you cringe and i'm and i'm very much and i'm aware of the kind of um the the kind of judiciary that operates on social media these days that 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 tends to condemn people and find them guilty before any legal due process has been found i think the same you could say the same thing has kevin spacey been charged or found guilty with anything Kevin Spacey is such a weird case, but I don't, th- I don't know if there have been actual legal proceedings yet. Well, but, but that's slightly my point, in that you, you, his films have all been withdrawn. Um, yeah. Yet there is no legal basis for that. So he's being punished in all sorts of ways in a kind of in the civil arena. He's being punished. The uh, the whole idea of law is innocent until proven guilty, yeah. and at the moment, nothing's been proven as guilty of breaking the law. Yeah. And, and you could go way back in. You, it's difficult to, 
you know, Mozart wasn't a, wasn't a clean living individual by any means. Charles Dickens was awful to his wife and to women. You know, you can't. I don't think you can just pull all these cultural things off the shelf yeah. because there are things that don't sit easily with how we view things now. Yeah, which is a long way of going about saying I was going to New York. <laughs> So you, so you went to New York. <laughs> so I went to New York. And it was a kind of, for me, it was a kind of film pilgrimage. Not just Woody Allen films, but like When Harry Met Sally, which and it's another one of my favourite films. But just to be in New York, you know, to, to wander around and see these things that you feel in a sense that you've grown up with, even though you've never been there. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to spend a few days doing that. And, and I just, I had the most wonderful time in New York. I did a gig on the last night as well, which was great fun. Just a just a short gig, and I just and I just felt it felt it felt really weird. It felt like I'd been there lots of times before. Yeah, yeah. I felt comfortable straight away. Yeah. So, what you did a gig at uh, a, a kind of fairly well known Gotham sh- Gotham Comedy Club, Gotham Comedy Club in in uh, New York, not yeah. in Gotham City. No, it doesn't but, exist. For no. Us. Um, and if it did, like, who would live there? I don't know. <laughs> but um, so, Gotham Comedy Club, and in front of an American audience, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not the first time he'd f- performed in front of Americans. No, and not the first time. I mean, obviously, working in London, I've performed in front of lots of Americans. But that's a different. That's a different way you approach it because they're they're not in their yeah. comfort zone. They're not in their house, yeah. if you were, if you will. Whereas I'd done a festival in Boston, um, Boston Comedy Festival, a few years ago with some big stars, Janine Garofalo and, and Eugene Merman, mm. which is great. Which is great fun as well. The first night we did at this enormous um, theatre in Boston, which was a very good gig thoroughly enjoyed the gig and then the next night um because it was a festival you move from venue to smaller venue and and across the, the next town the next time i did the next gig we did the following night was was i was following a burlesque act in a rough bar a burlesque act is basically a sort of like um how would you describe it? a glamorous uh, kind of stripper rounded more rounded strippers shall we say rubenesque so Rubenesque strippers. It's like stripping, but on the woman's terms. Isn't yeah, it? koi stripping. So it's, it's and that's teasing. not a type of fish. <laughs> it's that, I just mean that it's it's more teasing. I think that's a, that's a that's a very good word for me. Like if so, if a woman is like a feminist and is about empowerment and all that stuff, she's a burlesque dancer. Whereas if the woman just wants to get some money. Because and she doesn't care about all the other stuff. She's a stripper, right? See what I mean? Like burlesque is a sort of like uh, for a way for women to do stripping, but it's uh, it's an empowered form of stripping. Yeah, it's like a sort of it goes back to an old traditional form of entertainment and stuff yeah. like that. But I think, don't you think that like a lot of women now are doing do, are interested in going into burlesque in the same way that they're interested in going to what is it? Sort of uh, pole dancing lessons. Pole dancing lessons, maybe, but also, uh, what do you call women who, um, uh, some men like to go to these women and they will... Dominatrix. Dominatrix, right. Dominatrix also is in the world of, like, maybe sex workers and stuff, but a dominatrix... A dominatrix is kind of like empowered. So you're, and right. so I'm saying that it's trendy at the moment for 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 women to be interested in doing things like being a dominatrix or going into doing uh, what's the burlesque dancing, yeah. and it's a sort of a more acceptable, empowered form of uh, I guess sexy, so. sexy entertainment. I guess so. I- I, I, it's a very fine distinction to make. You're still taking your clothes off. <laughs> I know, taking your clothes off for, for essentially blokes in in a room. Yeah, I mean, but I, I get the distinction and I see what you mean. But I, you know, that's very. That's a, I think I, there's a fine line between. I think you know. that it's there though. I think the line does exist. I think. I think well, I, I don't disagree with that. And I think yeah. I mean, would women say they're doing burlesque or they're doing stripping? You know. There is a well, difference. Would a say it? There's a difference in style, well. though, as well. Like burlesque comes with a certain types of, um, d- uh, like they've always got those big uh, wings made of feathers, which they <laughs> kind of swans. Are they swans' wings? Is that swans. the idea? And they kind of like you know uh, reveal themselves from underneath yes. these, these these feathery wings. And, and, and stuff. I don't. I, 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 apart from the burlesque show I performed, I don't think I've ever been to a burlesque. So and it's not full nudity i think it's more coy than that it's yeah. more sort of carry on it's more uh, a sort of um a hint yeah of eroticism rather than full-on sex show yes. of some kind yes okay 
Anyway, <laughs> I, do you so know, I'm so, so uncomfortable talking about it. Do you know, years ago, I was um, an extra in a film, and this particular, I can't, was it called The Hunger? I can't remember. Anyway, I remember it because it was the day of the semi-final of Euro 96, and I desperately wanted to get out. But I was, <laughs> we were filming in this, in this, this strip club in West London, and it was basically a scene in the film where there was strippers on, on the stage and then blokes sitting at the bar. And, the, and I was so shy and, and really quite young. And the director said, right, you, you there, um, you're, in this scene, you're the groper. And that's the last thing I wanted to be. I just did. I just didn't want to be there. And we so many takes. And then in the end, what is a what is a groper? The groper then? is 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 a bloke who who uses his hands rather than his eyes, uh, and 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 takes un you know unwanted uh, physical affection. So, um, well, since we're talking about Woody Allen and stuff like yeah, exactly. that, it's all going groping way. is a word that that you should know, la- ladies and gentlemen. That uh, basically, yeah, it's, if you're talking about like the Me Too movement and and creepy men who do. Yes, they shouldn't do. The, but yeah, touching, touching, touching you when you don't want to be touched. Inappropriate touching in the inappropriate areas. This is yeah. groping. So anyway, in your in this movie, which, which was being, uh, I was I was chosen by to, to be the groper in in this scene at this strip club. So I'm supposed to. You're not allowed to touch the strippers, but I was supposed to reach out mm. and try and touch the stripper. And we had so many takes and in the end the stripper herself complained about me because I was so weak and ineffectual <laughs> and showed clearly no interest in, <laughs> in doing again. this at all really? and just do and so they had to they had to drop me as the groper and pick somebody who, who was up to the job a method actor yeah uh, the proper groper I see okay so you went to New York and uh, you performed I was going to ask uh, do you feel like American audiences are different to British audiences I didn't, I don't know, and, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't nervous about it in that respect either. I, I knew that New York is a sophisticated city, and I've worked all over the world in sophisticated cities and know what I'm doing. And, and the language was never going to be an issue. I just felt confident in it. I'd, I'd been there three days in New York, and I felt so at home with the place that mm. I didn't feel necessarily that I was out of my comfort zone or out of out of my own country in a, in a in a bizarre sense i felt at home so it didn't i didn't feel any nerves at all Do you reckon that's an english american thing possibly i just think i'd enjoyed myself so much for 3 days that i just felt that this wasn't going to ruin it either that i was just in complete control of what i was going to say how i was going to say it. i probably even Took the edges off my accent a little bit and made Did it a little, really? a little bit more English. Ah. And uh, and went, you know, probably by the end of my set, I was almost full on David Niven. <laughs> but I but I really kind of not poshed up a little bit, but just went a little bit more middle class. Because normally, than my when, accent normally is. when you speak, you've got a bit of a sort of. There's London a bit accent. of a mockney. There's a bit it's of mockney. Michael Caine in there yeah. sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, uh, mockney, you call mockney, it. Mockney is, is people who pretend to be cockney. Cockney is the London accent, basically. It's specifically, it's, you are born within the sound of the bow bells yeah. in the East End of London, which but I'm not. I'm a northerner. <laughs> if you speak like that, right? If you, all right, mate, all right, geezer, okay, do you fancy a cup of tea? Yeah. That is, that is Cockney. It's, but yeah, in, in effect, that is Cockney. Basically. But I, and that's how I tend to be on stage. Yeah. Even though I'm not, I'm not a Londoner at all. You're from a, Blackburn. I'm from Blackburn. How do you, how, what's a Blackburn I, I normally speak like that. That's, a, that's, that's my accent from where I was born. It was in Blackburn in Lancashire, yeah. When did you leave Blackburn? When I was seven. Okay, and then you moved to? You moved to East Anglia. Yeah. And I was uh, Where, and whereabouts? I, in Kings Lynn, near Kings Lynn in East near, Anglia. Near and Cambridge? That's east, east, near Norwich. Norwich. Near Norwich. No- Norfolk. There, Alan, p- far out east. Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. North and, Norfolk. And I was uh, first day at school in East Anglia. Obviously, I, I was still speaking like that because I'd just come from Lancashire. And I was beaten up on my first day at school Whoa, really? by by the by the local Norfolkians who regarded my accent <laughs> as weird. Which in Norfolk they speak like that all the time, and they thought I spoke stupid and beat me up. <laughs> and then four years later, we moved down south to Crawley, well Horsham, Crawley, Horsham, and then which is nearer London. And then people spoke with a more estuary accent; they spoke a bit more like this. Yeah, but I turned up my first day at school in Horsham speaking like that because I just come from Norfolk, <laughs> and I got beaten up on my first day at school. Listen to him. <laughs> Where are you from? Yeah, Blackburn. <laughs> if 
via Norfolk. <laughs> um, okay, so when you turn up on stage uh, at the Gotham Comedy Club in front of a room of what, about 100? Uh, yeah, about 100. There were um, on Thursday night, yeah. Yeah. Um, Americans, Americans. Mm hmm. And you we were the smattering of English. There were a few English in there as well. Okay. Um, and you turn up uh, dressed in a sort of... I was actually dressed like this. I mean, I'm in a three-piece check suit with a gold watch chain and a black roll neck. A gold watch chain. Is there an actual watch attached? It's attached to my Prince Albert. <laughs> Should not, I ask? It's not. It's not. You're going to have to explain what that no, not, uh, Prince Albert is a, is, a, is a piercing of the genital area. There's, no, for, my, for my, my watch chain is, um, is attached to nothing. It could be attached to something. But it's purely just for this. It's purely for ornamental. Show. So that it's it's a very nice, very fetching thing that it comes down from one of the buttons. Is is it important which button it comes down from? Well, as long as it hangs above. No, yeah. should, no, that's about right because it couldn't go just across. It has to ha- it has to hang, uh, say, a good two or three centimeters above the watch pocket on so, your waistcoat. So you've got the waistcoat, uh, and say it's quite a high buttoned waistcoat. Yeah, because that's the mod style, isn't With it? With the Normally. collar as well. With a the collar. The waistcoat has a collar. The waistcoat has got a collar. Quite high buttoned one. This is a sixties Italian cut. Yeah, three piece Italian cut. What's could the be, difference? Could be just, it's a different style of um, trouser for a start. There's no. It's a flat front. There's no pleats, which was different from the late fifties style. A, a pleat being a pleat the, being the, a fold at the front of of the trouser, which creates a line down the front. It creates a. It just creates a fold, almost like a like a the skirt in in a way. Yeah. A pleat. Yeah. Did I just say that? Yeah, you did. did. But I'm just thinking, like <laughs> it's a, pleat, a pleat, mate. Yeah, a pleat. Yeah, like a like a like a girl's like a schoolgirl's uh, skirt. Yes. Yeah. In the nice, yeah. in the best possible. It way. creates a it creates a roll in the fabric. Whereas oh. these don't. Oh, that, these I'm trying to don't. imagine a pleat on a trouser. Oh, well, eighties, fifties, so big sort of um, zoot suits. Yeah, they would have a pleat at the fr- uh, on the trousers. Those big sort of nineteen fifties big suits and eighties kind of new romantic trousers. Okay. They would have pleats on as well. On the side? No, on the front. On the front. On the front. Okay, so when you turn up on a stage mm. dressed as a mod, right? Yeah, and you open your mouth. In your English accent, whether it's you've maybe maybe you've pushed the sort of the the received pronunciation a bit more, or you're still speaking like Michael Caine, as your mobile phone continues to. Re- Ian is currently. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I've got a new mobile phone and I have no idea it's, how it works. He doesn't and know how to turn it's it doing off. Doing all manner of stuff. Is that is it? It's a Samsung, is it? It is. Yeah. There you go. That's it. Okay. Sorry about that. So. You turn up on stage, looking like you do and sounding like you do. What do the Americans think, or what do you what what what, what do you know about what they think? Well, the thing is, they'd all almost been told how to think by the compare, insofar as um, she went on, and she was very good, and she she got a good atmosphere in the room. I, I wasn't first on; I was second on, and she said uh, in my introduction, she said. Um, Please welcome this guy all the way from England, and he is the best dressed comedian I've ever seen in my life. And so, therefore, that's set a tone. So you don't, you can't then sort of walk obsequiously onto the stage. You walk on. You can't. You can't walk on as though you're embarrassed. Yeah, you, got you to, have to live up to your outfit. You got to own the the yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is what I did, and, and went straight into my stuff, and confidently said hello, how are you, and then just went into my stuff. Yeah, Cause and, I, and at no point did I feel like I had to chat to anybody or ingratiate. I mean, there were things, times that I chatted to the audience during it, but our cultural references between New York, London, but well, New York and London, I'd say, are so similar. Yeah, that there's no real problem in in translating anything, for instance. Yeah. Do you want a glass of water or something? Yeah. Okay. I just got Ian a glass of water and I had water on my hand, listeners, and I just literally just wiped, wiped it on my shirt. I am wearing a shirt, which I ironed. I Did ironed you? this. Yeah, I know. It doesn't look like it at all. At any point. Like, this, I, really, this century? I really ironed it hard, and it's still, like, I just can't iron creases out of shirts. Anyway, I just thought I wiped my wet hand on my shirt, and then I thought, oh, my God, this is not something that Ian would do. <laughs> Whatever perceptions you have of Luke from listening to this regularly. Wiping his hand on his, on his creased shirt probably doesn't fulfil ex- any fantasies. It's you an extremely have. creased shirt. How do I get this shirt? How do I get the creases out of this shirt? Well, you here? steam iron that, surely. 
Well, yeah. You mean you just put your iron on the hottest setting and you? But you spray water onto it as well. You spray water onto the shirt mm-hmm. so that it's iron, ironing damp. Right. And another way of getting creases out of clothes, he says. This is this is this is. I'm saying this my most Michael Caine way. <laughs> another way of getting creases out of clothes, and you learn this from being on the road all the time as a comedian. How you get creases out of suits, for instance, is a good way of doing this. Mm-hmm. Is you when you're in your hotel or wherever you're staying, you hang your clothes up in your bathroom take a really hot shower so the whole room steams up yeah and the creases fall out of the clothes ah i don't know the i don't know the physics of science that, but it works it. yeah it does work okay so i need to spray water on this spray first. water hot iron spray water on it and then don't wear it again so you're very exacting about the clothes that you wear do you have the same attitude about what other people wear are you judgmental about others dressing dress i clothes, used to dressing? be i think i used to be i think there's a number of things that change you in that regard, one, you get older and, and get more tired of the battle, <laughs> the, the, the battle that you're never going to win. And you're just like, just wear what you want to yeah, wear. Yeah, what the hell. But also, I've got, I've got three sons and two of them are teenage and they have very particular tastes. They're not, it's, none, it's, not stuff, it's not stuff that I would wear or ever wear or ever have worn. But, you know, they're very, not belligerent, they're, they are, they're, they're belligerent. So they're prepared to argue their case. They, yeah. you know, they'll they they respect their dad. But if their dad says, "Why are you wearing that?" and say, "Because it's X, Y, and Z, and I look better than you," <laughs> and they'll and th- and that's the argument they use. Okay? You know, that's how you've always dressed. You dress how you want to dress. We're doing the same. Well, you're trying to convince them to wear three piece Italian suits. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just saying. You know, do you have to show your ankles every time you go out? Is this is it, is this some kind of ankle competition going on? What? You know, why do you do you not have any proper footwear? Any footwear that you can polish, for instance? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, they're going out in trainers with ankle socks, and the the, yeah. the, the jeans or trousers are rolled up, they're rolled up. So the ankles up, are on the display. ankles, the mankles, as I believe they're called. Mankles, they're yeah, man- called mankles. Man's ankles. Yeah, I tried that in the summer briefly. Yeah, no, it's not a good look. For what were you wearing right? on your feet? Uh, I had trainers on. I've, I've I've relaxed in the last couple of years. I've, what? I've well, physical issues have meant that I had to see. Um, I've had back problems for years, mm-hmm. and my doctor in France, who hates me anyway, but I, he 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 recommended that I go and see a chiropodist. And so the chiropodist back, back doctor? No, that, no, that's a chiropractor. Doctor? Yeah, yeah. He said, "Well, maybe it's because of the way you're walking. Maybe it's, you've got a problem with your feet, and that's going up your spine." Yeah. So go and see a chiropodist. And the chiropodist said, "Can you bring in?" examples of the footwear that you that you wear You're like of and course I said, well i mean can i hire a van i've got i've got quite a lot of footwear and i turned up at the shop with about six pairs of very delicate loafers <laughs> and a couple of chelsea boots and he looks at me and he goes do you not wear anything else I went, no this is this is how i this is how i roll and he said no wonder you got back problems so wait a minute so you, you've been isu- you've been suffering from various health problems complaints mm. um including back problems mm-hmm. could this be a result of your mod uh well that's, lifestyle? That, was, that was the implication that was the implication that because i'm such a martyr to my own style to to the modernist style that i've i've actually damaged myself physically so that you know the chiropodist is going to suggest changes to your your yeah, ap- you know, apparel and you go full-on rocker more leather jackets and more bike. No, he didn't say that. He, no. just, he just he said, "Look, I'm going to give you this kind of simel, as they call it in France. It's an insole." Yeah, um, I'm, I'm wearing some in my shoes right now. Right. Yeah, and they were molded specifically for for all my footwear, and it's made not the slightest bit of difference. Yeah, I've got I've got. Um, so, listeners, Ian, you're going to love this. So I've got bunions on my toes, my oh, big that, toes. Uh, it's horrible. Yeah. So uh, bunions, listeners, are basically swollen joints in your feet. So, and, they, and they are my big toes. You're right. Okay. So this causes, I mean, you know, they, they, they still look beautiful. Don't worry. Everyone. Nobody's feet looks beautiful. That's the thing. That's the thing nobody... You know, yeah. This is one of those things that's not really discussed. Feet are disgusting. Yeah, they are weird things, yeah, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. So anyway, my big toe joints are all swollen and they can be very, very painful. They hurt a lot. Right. And also, I think it affects the way I walk as well, potentially, or maybe the toe thing is, is related to the way I stand and walk, that I favour my right foot. So I stand on my right foot 
And if I'm just standing there waiting for the bus, I'll be standing mainly on my right foot. And that means that one of my hips is slightly higher than the other. Everything's connected, though. The, f- the foot bone is connected to the Apparently there was a bone. song about this, but <laughs> everything is connected. The footballer, Steven Gerrard, when he first began playing in the first team for Liverpool, he had um, a number of injuries. And they tried to work out the source of these back and the hip and... Uh, I think it was groin related in, uh, injuries and in the end they took out his wisdom teeth what yeah they took out his wisdom teeth and the those sort of, sort of Wait injuries Stephen Gerrard had wisdom teeth I, I, well not for not for very long <laughs> um and and he was fine after that so oh. everything and I don't again I don't know the, the science of all this but everything is related so the, your wisdom teeth can affect how you're standing, how your how your body is adjusting to whatever pain is is somewhere else in your body. Interesting, because I, I still have my wisdom teeth; they haven't been removed. I've, so maybe, I've never had any. I you've never had it. They've I never even grown. Some adults yeah. don't have them, do they? Okay, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, that speaks volumes for my life. Well, I mean, I don't know if wisdom is the right word. If you got them, but Stephen, Ger- uh, you didn't get them, and Stephen Gerrard did, and I did. Maybe, maybe I don't know if wisdom. More. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But um, so anyway, so potentially the way I stand or the bunions in my feet also cause problems in my neck. So I have... Everything overcompensates. Yeah, I've got a slipped disc in my neck. Have you? Yeah, which plays up sometimes. uh, Recently it's been fine, but every now and then... It slips a little bit and it's horrible. I can't move my head at all. And that is painful. Back problems are... Have you ever had sciatica? No, I haven't had sciatica, but my wife's had it. My mum has it. Man alive. Yeah, horrible. So, sh- all right, shall we do a section on physical ailments now? Do you want, do you want to <laughs> How go- long have you got? We've got loads of time. Do you want to go through all the things that have been bothering you uh, in terms of your health? Okay, well, I'll just say where I am now, rather okay. than... Because I don't know what's caused all this. Probably lifestyle, but I have... Currently, uh, chronic rheumatoid inflammatory arthritis, psoriatic. You're going to have to explain every word. I don't understand any of what I just said. I just know I've got it. Chronic. Chronic chronic means permanent. Yeah. Chronic means it's not going away. Rheumatoid arthritis means an inflammation of the joints. So uh, inflammatory rheumatoid arthritis means an inflammation of the joints, which are very painful, which means I think it's to do with the cartilage or is that osteo? I'm not sure. Anyway, it's inflammation of the joints. All the joints. All the, all my joints. That's why it's because it's been going on for too long. It's not just it's all my joints. Yeah. Not all always at the same time, but yeah. they're all in pain. I've got double spinal hernia, which means slipped discs. Which means the cartilage on the on the two of the vertebrae have worn away completely. So it's the discs just rubbing against each other. Mm. which is unpleasant. Yeah, uh, nice. High blood pressure, which I didn't know about until last week, and I went to see the, the doctor, not about the high blood pressure, but she said, you've got high blood pressure. You're she, like, yeah, I'm in a doctor's. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. She said, are you always this stressed? And I said, I'm doing a gig in French this week. I am absolutely petrified. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and what's the other thing I've got? Oh, I don't know, something you, else. You said you had uh, nosebleeds. Nosebleeds, yeah. Well, that I think that's from... A, a, I had a dental implant a couple of years ago, and the French dentists are rough. They are yeah. rough as hell. Tell me about it, yeah. Oh, man alive. He literally knees on my shoulders with a hammer and tongue going away at me. Yeah. And ever since then, he put the implant in, and ever since then, I've had nosebleeds. But I went yeah. to the dentist, and the dentist said, well, it's not the implant, because it's nowhere near any any membrane or anything like that. So I'm, I'm going to go and see somebody about that next week as well. Talking of uh, rough French dentists, I had a lovely rough French dentist experience. <laughs> so I we went to my dentist. Uh, she wasn't there. So she was replaced by someone. Okay. She was That's replaced. Never a good no, not at all. She was replaced by essentially a homeless dentist, okay. a dentist who doesn't <laughs> have her own practice. It's just moving from one dentist, yeah. some one, one dental dentist. Yeah, exactly. Just moving around like, you know, so that's one thing. And, and so I normally go to the dentist with my wife. She handles all the French speaking and, and understanding and okay. I just provide the teeth. Right. right? <laughs> I arrived 10, 15 minutes before my wife did. So I went in the chair first okay. and I laid down the replacement dentist who looked like a plastic surgeon's sort of what practice book. Is that right? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, basically, she had dodged terrible plastic surgery. I don't know if that had anything oh, to do no, with it. Really? I didn't know how old she was. She was like an ageless sort of Paul Simon lookalike. Okay. If, okay, just picture that. 
And um, it's quite an image. Yeah. So she started going out at my teeth, and she was, you know, that thing where they clean. Yeah. Clean with a metal spike. A scraper. Scraper. Yeah. She was scraping. She was scraping my gums a lot. So a lot of gum work. I was bleeding fairly badly from my teeth. And she was going around doing that. She was talking to the assistant in French while she was doing it. And essentially, the, the, from what I could understand, what she was saying was, English people's teeth, you know, so she was going on about English people's no teeth. Way. English people's teeth stick out, she was saying. And it's because the alve- alveolar ridge is formed in a different way that uh, their teeth all stick out. What's the alveolar ridge? The alveolar ridge is that... Uh, behind your front just teeth? Just behind your front teeth, there is a, uh, a ridge before... So on your bite. The- yeah, so when you make a t sound... Yeah. T- the tip of your tongue touches the, that ridge. Okay. So you've got the alveolar ridge. Then on, behind that is the soft palate, they call it. Right. These are all things you learn when you learn about pronunciation and stuff. Right. So, so she said the alveolar ridge is formed differently and it pushes the teeth out. And then afterwards, after I'd, I was like checking out the blood coming out of my mouth in the mirror and stuff and my wife was chatting to her, she was going, oh yeah, English people don't like to have their teeth done and all this stuff. She's like, what the f- what are you, what are you talking about? Done? Well, not with a spike, so they're bleeding no, as you come out. Yeah, no. I don't like to have... Who mean, likes that? What you mean is, when you say English people don't like their ha- to have their teeth done, is what you mean is that English people don't like to be sp- stabbed in the teeth <laughs> while being racially abused. <laughs> that's. Well, I think that's... Well, she's probably got a point. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's true. <laughs> English people don't like that. But uh, anyway, it was pretty bizarre. And yeah, like the worst treatment I've had. Like, my gums are all like purple around my teeth and they're all bleeding and stuff. It was horrible. Did you um, have to pay for that as well? Uh, of you did. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like partially refunded, but also yeah. you have to pay for some of it too. I mean, the teeth were clean, but yeah. also a lot of my gums were clean too. I don't know. I don't know. They, there's something about medics, and I think in France that that they have, they are highly qualified, and you know everybody needs them and stuff. But they just make arbitrary decisions. Without your consent at times. I took my kids to the dentist. And this is how I found out that I needed an implant in the first place. Because I had a crown on my front tooth. I'd had it kicked out playing football years ago and had it, and had a crown put on. And I was in the dentist uh, and the kids had been seen too. And I just said to him, I said, I'm having a problem because my crown's loose or it feels loose. It, maybe I'm just, you know, it's 20 years since I had it done Maybe it's just, you know, past its sell-by date or whatever. And he said, sit down in the chair. Five minutes later, I'm lying back in that chair, and he has done, to show to my kids that there's a crack in my crown, he's put a syringe needle from the inside of my mouth, so it's sticking out. My kids are now screaming, going, what have you done to Daddy? He's got a metal spike sticking out of his mouth. And he said... There you go, you see. I'm just showing you that your crown is fractured and you need to get it changed quickly or your face will collapse. So you could have just told me that. You didn't need yeah. to demonstrate. Didn't have to demonstrate that to two very young boys at the time who are even now having nightmares about the whole thing. <laughs> oh, well, well. Okay, so like um, little health complaints and things. Could this be as a result of your mod choices <laughs> in life? I don't know if it's mod choices. I don't know why... I don't know why I've got all this stuff at the moment. I think that it's possibly a result of... I've lived in France for 15 years, so for for 15 years, almost every week, 90% of the time, I've been commuting backwards and forwards between the UK, to, to gig in the UK and to live at home in rural France. On the Eurostar? On the Eurostar or on budget airlines or in a car or sometimes a bus. I made it... Uh, and almost a mission that I wouldn't have the same journey two weeks in a row. I, I couldn't have the same journey two weeks in a row because then it would make it. It would feel like a commute, and I didn't want. I didn't want that kind of laborious ennui. I didn't want to feel like I was being forced to go where I was going. So I made sure that the journey was different every week. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't do it every single week, obviously, but you no two consecutive weeks were the same journey. But that meant a lot of faffing around. It meant getting up at crack of dawn to come home. So I always made a point of, again, needing to come home as soon as I possibly could. So I'd be getting up at four o'clock in the morning and waiting in the cold, 
bus station with a heavy bag over my shoulder. And that takes its toll. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Physically, that takes its toll. I think mentally it takes its toll. And, and mentally, that has an effect on your body. You run out of energy. You run out of, you run out of the energy to be able to recuperate, especially when you're doing it every week. How long have you been a professional stand-up comedian or touring stand-up comedian? A touring stand-up comedian, I would say 22 years, 23 years. Yeah. Do you and always... that's, that's a long time. It's a long time on the road living out of cases, you know. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you, what kind of bag do you have? I have got the world's greatest bag. I bet you do. I, I bet you've got, got a got very stylish bag. I right? absolutely love this bag. I bought this bag when we first moved to France, and it's it's a Samsonite. They don't make it anymore. It was a Samsonite. It's almost like a TARDIS. A TARDIS is the Doctor Who spaceship, so it's bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. Right. And it's a very small, what looks like a very small case, but it folds out triple wires. Ooh. On the back, there's a back pocket that folds out triple wise, so I can get two suits in there, and they'll barely crease. Fold them back up, and then you've still got the case in the front like that. Wow! And it, and it's so, and it's so good because it doesn't. It's black, and it doesn't look very big. So nobody's ever stopped me and gone, "That's too big for cabin luggage," which it is. And because you wear it over your shoulder, and you don't have to wheel it around like a loser. I hate wheelie cases. Ah. But carrying a bag over your shoulder is one of the worst things you can do to well, your back. Yes. So I used to do that. So I used to always carry my bag over my shoulder. And yeah. when I was working at university for a few years, I used to carry this big leather. It was a really nice leather, like a real leather sort of large satchel. Yeah. I used to carry it over my shoulder. And I had all the exam um, like photocopies in there, all yeah. my students' exams. And often it would be very heavy and I'd be slinging it over my shoulder. And I suffered so much during that period with like the bad yeah. neck and everything. And I, uh, I'm no medic, but that's probably what's giving you bunions. What? That bag. Yeah. That original no, bag. The bag. Everything's the bag. connected. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I was saying it earlier, that that is either giving me the bunions or the bunions are giving me the neck yeah, yeah. or all of it's because of the way I favor one leg when I stand. So yeah. now it's like, uh, now I've entered the second phase of my life. Yeah. Where the first half of my life, I stood on my right foot. Now I'm standing on my left foot now. Right. That's yeah. the Has def- that made a difference? The defining feature. <laughs> because of- I was told, I went to see a physiotherapist in France and he was a lovely bloke from, from Belgium and he said, what do you do for a living? And I'm stand up. And he said, well, that's, for one, that's tough on your back. You are standing while you're working, right? Yeah. So he says, how do you stand? Is and, it- I, and I kind of showed him and he said, well, you're favoring, you're favoring your left leg. So the next time you do a gig, I want you to favor your right leg. And it didn't work. But it wasn't it funny. It didn't work. It didn't, no, no humour in that at all. I right. tried to get 20 minutes out of just standing on my right leg. Standing and on your right leg, there. no one laughed. But it, was, it, but it felt odd. Yeah. It felt the choreography of how I had been doing stand-up for 20 years by that point just felt slightly odd. It's an interesting question because as a comedian myself, I don't have the same level of experience that you do, but often uh, before a show, I will think about little details like that like my mind gets plagued with all sorts of uh, um, extraneous mm. details like for example what kind of clothes i'm going to wear and how i stand on stage so for me the best gigs are when i'm actually moving while i'm talking and everything's quite fluid and i'm moving around a lot and then the worst gigs i feel i realize i'm, I'm you're rigid i'm stuck to the spot and i'm yeah. rigid yeah. and then and the worst is when I realise, oh shit, I'm just stuck to this spot and I'm really, really rigid. So I'm going to move now. And then you move and it's like a really awkward I move think, and it doesn't work. I think a lot of comics, when they first start out, get kind of bogged down in that stuff as well. And I think one of the things you can do to try and make that less of an issue is to do comparing where you are forced to address the whole room and forced to use whatever stage you have to move over to the right if something's going on, to move over to the left. It forces you out of yourself yeah. and, and to use the area that you've been given. Yeah. I actually like doing the large stages that I've done sometimes when I'm usually performing on someone else's show, right. like with Paul, for yeah. example. And, and I'll get the chance to, do, to, to uh, perform on quite a wide stage in front of a large audience. That is amazing because yeah. you get to like walk from yeah. one side to the other. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Like the first, it, it's, it's wonderful because the first thing you do, you come out, you get the microphone, you start pacing up and down and sort of addressing everyone. Yeah. That is amazing. And then you're walking and talking and it's really, really good. And it, you make it's very it, liberating as yeah. a stand-up as well, and and you can, 
it helps the performance of what of your material you get more out of your material and you realize there's more in your material because you're 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 forcing yourself to be more physical and if you can get material isn't just about being verbal or just being physical it's about matching up the two things yes yes and and a big stage obviously gives you the opportunity to do that but comparing does that as well but this Belgian guy, anyway, was saying that stand-up is very bad for your back. And basically, basically, he was saying yeah, that. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. all right. My, ent- <laughs> my entire lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, your entire lifestyle is bad for you, bad yeah. for your lifestyle. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you, you, you're still doing stand-up quite a lot uh, in London. If any of my listeners, and I have had some listeners who've come to London and, and uh, gone to a comedy show, and I always recommend the Comedy Store because it's my favourite one. It's the best club in the world. So the, the Comedy Store in London, is it Leicester Square? Yeah, just off Leicester Square. Yeah. yeah. Uh, always my recommendation for going to see stand-up in London. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, those are the three. Those are the pure stand-up nights. Yeah. And then on a Sunday and Wednesday, there's improv, world-famous improv, and on a Tuesday, there's a, what they call Cutting Edge, which is um, topical news, uh-huh. topical uh, news programs. And Monday's the Gong Show, isn't it? Monday's, the last Monday of every month is the Gong Show, which that is pitiful. It's um, horrible. I it, uh, that's what, it, to explain what the Gong Show is, it's an opportunity for people who've never really done stand-up before to go onto the stage at the comedy store and try and last long enough before they're gonged off. A gong is like a big, um, like a bell, kind of flat yeah, bell. Yeah, dinner gong. Bong! Like that. So, yeah, um, yeah so basically, the, the, as a performer, the gong show is quite legendary, certainly in the open mic act uh, scene. Yeah. And once you, you know, um, graduate to the professional stuff, is like... If you can get through that, you're, you're doing extremely well. But if you don't get through that, it is no way a reflection on your skills as a comedian. It's just, it's a night in and of itself. It's quite brutal. It's I think I may brutal. have mentioned it on this podcast before because I spoke to Rob and I think he did the gong show. He did the gong show when I was compare. Right. So let me just explain what the gong show is just so my listeners understand exactly. So as a performer, you go up and you've got a maximum of what, five minutes? Five minutes. Okay. But the first two minutes... Uh, you're being judged, so no, no, you're no? judged through the whole all thing, all the way through the five you're minutes. Judged the whole thing. So you the, do the, the whole could go off at any at point any in moment. that five minutes. So you go up, you got five minutes, you start doing your material in front of the audience, and red flags have been passed out. Yeah, there are three judges in the audience who have red red cards, effectively a bit like football, and they can hold them off, hold them up at any point um, to say that they want you off the stage. And once all three judges have made that decision. I then gong the gong, and you have to get off the stage. Okay, and some people last a matter of seconds, don't they? Oh, literally seconds. Some but people- then uh, you know, because we're it's it's such a brutal thing. I remember there was I was doing it once, and I, I in no way think this is big or clever. But there was some guy I knew he'd come all the way from Australia to uh, to to perform at the gong show in London and he jumped onto the stage but he was wearing flip flops and I just I banged the gong straight away <laughs> I will not have any form of beach leisure wear on the greatest comedy stage in the world and that, Is that was what you it. said after two and a half seconds <laughs> So you can see how brutal it is, ladies and gents. You can come up and literally you're just your appearance can, can get you either all three red flags or a gong and you have to, to, to walk away or you go up and your first joke it doesn't go down very well and you get a couple of red flags and then before you know it, you're, you're flagged off. I've never done the gong show. I, I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite a spectacle if you're in the audience and no vested interest. Yeah. But like I say, it is no, it's not a judgment on anybody's comedic ability if you fail or even get through, to be so honest. That, so that's Monday night. And, and so essentially, I always recommend to my students that if they go to London, they want to see comedy, they go to the comedy store. And some of them have, some of, some of them have definitely gone at the weekend, so they may have seen you comparing. Mm-hmm. So you're there sometimes doing the, the emceeing at the comedy store still in London? Yeah, yeah, about three or four times a year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's the best show in the world. It's, it's you know, it's when you're, when you're comparing what is the best comedy stage in the world with, you know, some of the top acts. It is it's such a it's such a buzz. It's such a buzz. You know, there's no finer feeling in stand up for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um hmm, I've got several other things left that I wanted to talk to you about before we end. Okay. So one of them is um shall I bring it up? The B the B word? If, well we should do the thing about language learning. Yeah, okay, we? let's get yeah. into that then. Yeah. So so as a uh, an English person living in France 
you've been learning. Have you been learning French? Have you been actively applying yourself to learning the language? I, I did and I didn't. And I tried various ways of doing it. And in the end, because for most of the time I've been living in France, I've only been here half the week. I was just too tired, you know, yeah. and, and didn't make the proper effort that I, that I should have made. And also, you know, we, I, we tried various things at home to, to try and artificially force us to speak French at home, which we don't. We speak English at home mainly. Your wife is French. My wife's she's half she's half French. She's she, she's bilingual. She's definitely she's more French than English. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and the kids are all French and English. And you know we tried to do this thing, but where we we forced the French, and it didn't. It never worked. It never. One of my kids actually said to me, "Daddy, I don't want to speak French at home when you're here because when you're at home, we want to be able to understand what you're saying," which is a, <laughs> a <laughs> a brutal assessment of my language skills, basically. But then with um, with Brexit and all of... I decided the day after Brexit that I had to become French. I knew that with the personalities involved in Brexit and with the promises that were made with Brexit, that it would turn out to be an utter, utter shit show. And I had to take steps to protect to protect my family. I was genuinely, genuinely concerned that at some point we could be split up as a family. You're basically, you're like Liam Neeson on this. <laughs> I, am. I am. I'm slightly better dressed. I'll but. do anything to protect my family. <laughs> I'll even become French. It's Paris, exactly. Exactly. But, it, but there, I was genuinely, genuinely scared that um, with the kind of talk that was coming out of Britain in that we don't want EU immigrants or if there are EU migrants, then they have to have an earning threshold. If not, then they have to leave. Now, if that was reciprocated in France, I wasn't earning any money in France. I was earning all my money outside of France. So I would be subject to that kind of reciprocal arrangement. So my family could stay or I could go. And anyway, the fear grew. And so I made the decision the day after the Brexit referendum that I would try and get the French nationality. And the first thing you have to do to get French nationality, the first hurdle you have to jump over is to, to pass the French language test. It's the uh, I'm trying to. It's the TCF. It's the test de connaissance de français or français. There's a, there's a few different names for it. There's there, yeah, but they all have but the same yeah, kind of TCF. European level of of, yeah, of minimum level that you have to achieve. It's based on the European framework of common reference for lang- the um, E. God, I know that acronym off by heart. You should do European reference of ECF, e, European Common Framework of Reference ECFR. And so, yeah, the, and the requirement is that you have uh, a minimum B1, which is basically an intermediate level of French, yeah. which is like, you know, the basic stuff that School you need to School stuff, get. isn't it, basically? Yeah, it's GCSE, yeah. maybe even yeah. less than that. Yeah. yeah. But, as ever, with these things, there's a, and my French is better than that. And I'd really learned, I'd really put in the effort, all I did was listen to, to French radio, I, I'd made a massive effort and, and, and made, uh, you know, an, an effort to get out of my comfort zone as well. Mm-hmm to go out and speak to people and just just speak more French. And perform in French. And perform. I've done a few gigs in, in French, which is utterly terrifying, utterly terrifying. Um, so I, and, and, and we sat down, we, we had to fill in the application form to, to take this, this, this language test. And my wife actually said to me, she said, shall we put you down as a mute? <laughs> and I, Wait, a mute is somebody who can't speak. <laughs> you think that would be better than, than well, she, she, I think we were scrabbling around for anything that would uh, mean I could avoid having this French language test right I see you know so she <laughs> said if we put it down, having some kind of language disability yeah maybe they'll just wave you through they'll let you through yeah, yeah if you do that of like I'm sorry and, he's deaf dumb and blind <laughs> yeah he plays pinball but very little else <laughs> um <laughs> uh, that's a reference to the who by the way yeah. pinball wizard Tell and me. he um and she, so, and we said, no, you know, we can't, we can't avoid this. We can't avoid this, this thing. I have to go through it. And I turned up at the, I took my test in Tours, uh, which is not far from where I live. And the first part of the test was like a 25 minute listening, multiple choice. Yeah. And everybody else in the room was already a French speaker. They were, they were all from um, former colonies of France, Afri- oh. African colonies of France or yeah. North African um, states. Yeah. So they spoke French, but they were just going through this kind of... They had to go through the same hurdle I had. And even they 
were all standing around after the test going, man, that was hard, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, God, I'd stopped listening after about two minutes. When I did that, so I, I did exactly the same thing as you, and I was there doing the computer-based test for 25 minutes, struggling, struggling and stuff, and it reveals your score at the end. Oh, yeah, I didn't have that. It reveals my score on the screen afterwards. And uh, what I, I came out as B1 in the... Uh, in the listening which I was very disappointed by because when I've been practicing it like listening understanding people yeah. is the thing I can do like yeah. I can't do most other things but responding yeah I, I can't respond no I, I can understand what people say I don't understand I don't know how I can understand what they say Ian because I don't really know any words or grammar so I don't know how I'm understanding them I think I just use the force I use the Jedi mind trick <laughs> To understand people when they speak French. Because I, I literally can't be like, okay, and that word, that word, but that's, that word. But, but that's because you're seeing them as well. And there's, there's a rhythm mm. and to how people Context. talk. And, absolutely. But facial expression and all of that. And you can gauge question or answer or, yeah. or um, rhetorical question or whatever. Yeah. Well, if it's just a listening comprehension, all of those yeah. weapons that you have are taken away from Much you. Much more difficult. Um, and so anyway, I was listening to it. And not you know normally in my practice listening test I've been doing at home, I was coming out pretty good and a lot of the time I was like C1 which was amazing that's, that's advanced good. That's I was good. like bloody hell how am I managing this yeah and then in the actual exam of course being in the exam room the the you know the tension I couldn't I didn't know where to look I couldn't find my comfortable zone I, I realized that my mind was drifting and yeah. like it was really hard to focus and so I knew I was answering questions knowing that I was getting them wrong it's like oh god this is a nightmare in the end it came up B1 which is you know the, the that's the minimum requirement minimum. I looked around at the other screens as people were leaving and I glanced at the other screens C1 C1 C2 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 all these other people are how oh, you bastards that's that's the, but I mean we didn't have that we didn't ours wasn't computerised ours was just pen and paper oh uh, well I, I, yeah so I didn't I didn't even I didn't out there, in I didn't the, have that luxury that I'd actually passed. I thought out there in the countryside, God, it's a different there, story. Chalk but, and slate, where yeah. I was. But I didn't get the result until later. That I just right. the result of my listening thing came up. Yeah, and then I had to do the speaking thing, which I talked to you about earlier, which was um, horrible. But amazingly, I got B two in the speaking. Even though it all went wrong, I ended up with B2. I must have done so well in the first two. Or she was so, I, I was so nice. I was like, I made a point of, 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 you know, doing the French thing, which they like a lot, which is that what, you, you kissed her on both cheeks. I, I well, I it's tried. Over familiar? Yeah, no, she, yeah, that wasn't appropriate, unfortunately. But they, that was before they pressed record on the tape machine. But, um, you know, I tried to be very polite, you know, and, and do all the things they expect. I, I made an effort. I ironed a shirt more Did than you? this, better oh, than I this. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but I, it was so awful. But maybe I survived. And it, for me, like the last three minutes of the test were an absolute disaster. But maybe I'd got to the B2 point before it all went wrong. I don't yeah. know. But I got B2 from that. So I got B1 in, in the end uh, overall. I think I got B2. I can't remember. I think it was B2. It wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be employed by by UNICEF as a translator in any <laughs> in the upcoming weeks, that's for sure. But I had my disasters during the whole thing. How was your speaking test? Well, I, you see, I, it, was, it was awful. It was just, I still, even now, wake up sweating and going, why? How, why did you do that? Because as you know, the, the first part, there's three parts of the speaking test. The first part is you just have to introduce and talk about yourself. That's easy. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we can do mm -hmm. that. The second part was um, a role play where the examiner gives you a role play. The examiner then leaves the room, and so you've got two minutes to prepare. She comes back, he or she comes back into the room, presses record, and you begin the role play. And that, for me, was... I, maybe I was overthinking it. Maybe I was just looking for laughs. I don't know. But the role play <laughs> that, the, that the examiner gave me was... I'm going away for a month. I'd like you to look after my dog. And the idea from that, from that start, that conversation starts, is you then have a chat about the whole thing, the, maybe the logistics of whatever. Anyway, she left the room. I prepared. She came back in. She pressed record on the machine, and she said, I'm going away for a month. I'd like to look after my dog. And I said, I don't want your dog. <laughs> and her face just fell, and she pressed stop on the record and said, you must have the dog. <laughs> and... <laughs> We heard this kind of row for about five minutes over whether I had to have the dog. But she wasn't... And then she pressed record again during this conversation. Yeah. So it was, it was clear that yeah. I decided I wasn't going to change my position on the whole having the dog thing. Yeah. So she decided to just record and go with it. The argument. Yeah. 
So maybe I, maybe I was very French in that argument. I have no idea. Surely, uh, non is the is the it's, it's default. Isn't yeah, it? the default thing. I, I'm surprised you yeah. were so so unprepared for I'm that. I'm sorry, I don't want your dog. I'm on strike that week. Yeah, I don't. I'm allergic to dogs. Now yeah. what? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, don't go on holiday. Because I would imagine that she like probably. Were you doing it for laughs? You were, weren't you? You were. I don't, you, you see, were. this Come is on. the thing. This is the thing. A part of you as a comedian, and I was having this conversation with another comedian the other night, and that part of you is going, just play it straight. There, yeah. you, there is nothing to be gained here by being clever or, or even trying to be funny. Mm-hmm. There really is nothing here. But equally, there was nothing on that piece of paper that said, I had to have this bloody dog. <laughs> I don't even know you. I just met you one minute ago. You're my so French examiner. You now you're trying you to get me yeah, to what, look after your what, dog. Is this some kind of bribe? What, I get my nationality if I look after your dog? What the hell's going on? Anyway, <laughs> so we moved on to the third part of the of the TCF examination, the, the oral part of it, which is the most French part because it's the most it's the, it's what I what I called the dinner party part of the yeah. of the exam in that it's the kind of philosophical open ended question that would be thrown out around a French dinner table and then would just the next few hours would just be wild away as various people had various opinions on whatever the subject is. Everyone gets their turn as well. Everyone gets their yep. spot. Yep. So at a French yep. dinner party where you get your moment to like say what you've got to say and everyone will yep. listen to you but you speak for like five minutes or something yep. about this thing and you give your opinions you present your philosophical yep. uh, what's the word for it uh, problematic yep. to them uh, to your to the, the, your co-eaters, and um, okay. So, what was yours then? What was your question? My my question was, um, and apologies for the French accent, but that's how it is. Peut on connaître des pays à travers le livre? Now that, uh, as I know now, that translates as, can you know a country across their literature? Can you know a country th- through through their literature? Yeah. And I knew that I knew the Peton Connect de P, can you know a country? And I knew Le Livre, I knew their literature. The à travers thing in the middle, mm-hmm. that connecting thing, uh, just through. It yeah. just literally threw me. Hey, there you go. It's a different spelling, folks. <laughs> you know, through, spelled T H R E W, the past participle of throw, which sounds the same as the per- preposition through, T H R O U G H. That is where the the joke comes from, ladies and gents. There you go. Okay, now we there can you go. Uh, but for me, à travers, and I was thinking, I don't know this. I don't know à travers. Where where there must be something. And I was, you get, you know, when you're really scrabbling around and, and going through your kind of French word roller decks, spinning in your head. À travers, I couldn't get it. And then it came in travers, barbecue ribs. <laughs> Travers means barbecue ribs. Travers is a, is a word is is what is, is, is barbecue ribs. So I thought I, suddenly this light bulb went off above my head. Can you know a country from their outdoor cooking books? Yeah. And I just went on for about five minutes about outdoor cooking in various countries. Like if it is, if that country is Australia, then the answer is yes. Yeah. You know, and oh, I don't know. And she was just looking at me like this bloke's insane. He not only doesn't want my dog, <laughs> but he thinks that this is all about outdoor cooking and barbecue ribs. She's going, oh, oh les Brit, les, les Anglais, quoi, la Brexit, quoi. They're yeah. Obsessed with roast beef, these people. Yeah, and cooking and, outside. And and I and I came out of that room, and then it hit me about what Atraver was, and I just felt just so stupid she must have thought I, it was secretly being filmed or something like that <laughs> that i was some kind of setup and i and i was i was i was just crushed i was literally crushed and then i got a letter about two weeks later which said i thought you have attained the tcf that you that you need and it wasn't that at all i can't remember what the ver- the ver- french verb is attendre mm. something like that but basically it just meant well done you turned up it was basically a letter confirming the fact that i'd taken the bloody exam not right. that i'd passed it that's it yeah i'm jumping up and down going and I'm, i was actually at work at the comedy store yeah. and and I, it was and it came through via email and I forwarded the email to my wife saying, hey, you know, we passed. And she just emailed me back saying, no, 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 
you just turned up. Because well, well done. In France, if something is not on paper, then it didn't happen. Absolutely. So it has to be put on papers just to so everyone's got a record that yeah. you did attend the yeah. thing. So that blah 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, uh, I mean, I told you about mine earlier. I have mentioned it on the podcast before, but uh, yeah, it was horrible. Just like missing one word, uh, one yeah. word I didn't understand yeah. threw me completely. I mean, I'm not really capable of of doing that five minute uh, talk at the dinner table anyway. Um, but I didn't really understand the question. So I, I, I managed to produce about three sentences before I just basically a shut down. <laughs> I went into kind of low power mode, you know, like when you, when the batteries run out on a device and it's just kind of going, bup, 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 you know, like just ticking over, like there is some, some residual electricity in there somewhere. So I was just like, uh, in a perpetual state of, um, I'm about to say something, uh, I'm about to say something brilliant. And then the time ran out and, uh, and cause I, I didn't understand a word or something. And then, um, as I was saying to you earlier, I was sweating so much. The, pour, the sweat was pouring off me cause I, I will sweat if I'm nervous, if I'm put on the spot, I just start sweating. It's really weird. And it was July. So it was, it was boiling hot. So I was pouring sweat, sweat pouring, dripping off my nose during this test. I don't think she noticed maybe the, 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 the level of French because she was so distracted by the, the, the perspiration, the liquid that was exiting my body was like more interesting than the French that was coming out. And, um, and so I, at the end of the test, she switched off the recorder and I said to her, Ooh, part three was difficult. I said in French. And she said to me, Oh, no, that's okay. We've got a lift from the third floor. <laughs> and I was like, thank God that wasn't in the test. <laughs> Just finding your way out of the room. Part four yeah. of the oral she, examination. She didn't, obviously, she didn't understand what I had said because I probably said something complete, some absolute shit to her. And she had l- taken one look at me and the context of this man is hot overrided any other potential communicative factor so that the only message she understood from that was I am hot I don't want to walk downstairs because it will be uncomfortable she's like oh no don't worry there's a lift from the third floor she clearly felt sorry for you yeah though. she did yeah. Clear, I yeah. mean you'd won her over whereas this this woman hated me she... I did win her over I'm very good at, 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 at doing that at finding ways of, of sort of failing like grac- nobly. graciously right. nobly nobly kind of collapsing in front of right. people and then they take pity on me yeah that's how, that's most of my French interactions are that, where I'm like, I go to the post office and I'm like, right, so in English, it's like, good day, madam, I have this package which I have to send back to this company. Uh, can you please talk me through the necessary steps? And here it's like, uh, uh, I have package uh, to, uh, I generally start sentences and wait for them to finish them. And then if they're right, I'm like, yes, if they've got the wrong sentence, and then I go, you know, it's terrible. It's a total disaster. It's debilitating, isn't it? I, I because feel, we both speak for a living as well, yeah. and and I and I find it. And my wife has, has said this that, um, and my in laws have said this as well. And my mother in laws French, and that I've, I'm pleasingly I've now reached a level of French where where my personality is actually able to show. Oh, I'm far from which that. is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> And we've fallen out with lost family since that has happened. Ah. I was just a quiet, polite bloke at the end of the table before this. Now they know that I can be a right shit. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was saying to you earlier that, like, um, well, first of all, I don't know how I understand people. I think it's the Jedi mind trick. And secondly, what was it I was saying earlier? That's it. What I was saying to you earlier is that I've realized that, first of all, I'm, I'm a good teacher, right? So I've been teaching for 20 years. So I'm, I'm a pretty good English language teacher and I know what I'm doing. And I'm a, I'm a good teacher, but I'm a bad learner. Right. So I find it's better, it's more effective if I can just teach people the English that I need them to know for yeah. that particular transaction than for me to speak, to try and speak French. So it's like, let me just teach you English for this situation yeah. and then we'll move on. You know, that, that well, seems you, to be more effective. If you effective. could do that for roughly 60 million people <laughs> living in France on an individual basis, you won't have to learn French yeah. anymore. That's, that's, that's essentially what I'm everything. doing. That's essentially what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm attempting to teach the French English so I don't have to learn French. <laughs> By one. It yeah. might take a while. Yes, I know. I, uh, yeah. That, uh, I, that's what I've, I've found because I've had to use French a lot more since, since I set up the, the Chambre d'Ort in, in the Loire Valley. 
Um, this is your guest house. This is the guest house where we live, yeah. so that I don't have to go travelling every every weekend. Mm-hmm. And again, it was a it was supposed to be um, a, a safe. A fallback for the Brexit thing, if I didn't get the nationality, because I was told I wouldn't get the nationality anyway. I had a police interview, one of many police interviews, more police interviews than most other people who've police had. Police interviews? F- to, get the, to get the nationality oh, thing. Yeah. I, had, I had armed police turn up the door and want to see my papers and rifle through some drawers and stuff. I was called into another police interview in tour and then i had another police interview in chateau which i don't know what that was about but it, we were talking about the nationality they're trying to find out your motives to be for why you want to become french basically and we talked about it and and you know my french isn't great but this police woman was really lovely and really really quite sweet and, and very understanding and she said um she said, "Look, I'll recommend you to get the to get the nationality." And I said, "That's that's very kind of you." And then she said, "But you won't get it." And and I I said, "Sorry, I don't I don't. What do you mean? Why why wouldn't I why wouldn't I get it? If you're recommending it to, for for me to go forward for that, why would I not get that?" And she said, "Because it's your first time. Meaning, this is France. You don't nobody gets anything the first time they apply for it." You know, she said it's like a driving license. Nobody passes first time. You have to go through the whole process again. Mm. I mean, I did get it, but because I didn't think I'd get it, I had to have a, a fallback, like I said, which is why we set up the Chambre the, the B and B where we are, so that I am earning money in the French system, so mm. that that wouldn't be an issue. As I said earlier, with you know, with reciprocal rights between the UK and and France and the EU. And what I found with is that I'm forced to to interact with people you know more than i normally would you know and and chatting to people oh because of the the guest house because i'm yeah and and some and the french especially the idea of a chambre d'hôte with the french is not just a b&b this is not just where we're laying our head down for the night you we're at breakfast and this this is breakfast table and that means you stay and you chat to us yeah, you know, yeah. who are you? Why? Why are you English? Why, why are you here? Why have you set this up? What's this yeah, all yeah, about? Yeah. And it, and it's helped enormously. Why? With, why are you English? Why are you English? <laughs> what on earth? What kind of decision was that you made at a very early age before you'd thought it through at all? Yeah. Um, but it's helped enormously, and also gigging in French. When I gigged in French uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was absolutely, absolutely terrified of it. Um, I hadn't done. I felt I hadn't prepared enough, even though I had. I just felt that it was so far out of my comfort zone that I was just going to fall down flat on my face, which is, if anything, I'm about no loss of dignity. That's that's, if Somebody should put that on my tombstone. At least he didn't lose dignity. Yeah. And the gig went really well. And it gave me the confidence then, if I can stand up in front of, French people using their language and get laughs out of that. I can order a bloody coffee yeah. without without trying to make you know looking like an idiot, you yeah. know. And I and I've got far more confidence in the last month than I had before that. You know, yeah. I'm willing to. You know, we were in that we were in that cafe downstairs where point blank they refused to speak French to us. Yeah. Even though I was, I, you you were speaking English to them and they were speaking English to to both of us. And then when I went to pay, I just insisted. On speaking did in French, they speak French to you. She responded in French. Eventually, it, I wore the show. woman down. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I've uh, my listeners might be tremendously disappointed to learn that I'm not a great learner of French because obviously I've, I'm an international expert in language acquisition <laughs> and uh, a guru of, of language learning and all that stuff. But um, you know, I don't necessarily apply to. But, that, but that's. But I don't think that's even if you were, even if we were both fluent in French. They would still have spoken to us in English in that in that bar. They, well, that's, that's just Paris. They've designed that that bar is me, you know they're meant to speak English in there because the owner has gone. Okay, so we get a lot of tourists around here. I only want staff who can speak oh, fluent English. Really? And so if you hear someone who is like an English speaker, an Anglophone, please speak English with them. Please use your English because we're not like those cliched French uh, uh, waiters who refuse to speak English. We will speak English. Well, I've, I've never met a, a cliched French waiter in that in that case. Mm, and they all speak. English. They all do speak English. Yeah, they they pretty much do. But uh, certainly more and more, I feel like it. It's becoming a thing where 
if it, I'll go into a place, like usually quite a trendy spot near here. Yeah. Not that I'm always going to trendy spots, but I'll go into some nice cafe or shop, right, yeah. on the street, on the road. And, um, and I'll say, bonjour. And they immediately, they can just, yeah. he's English. And yeah. they're like, hi, how are you doing? I'm like, damn, what did, which part of bonjour was wrong? And, and, you know, it's that, disheartening though, isn't it? Well, I'm, you know, I then just switched to English because, um, you know, that's just, uh, I'm more stubborn. Uh, yeah. I've got to be more stubborn. I'm not stubborn enough and I'm too agreeable. And, and, and I've never been accused of being agreeable. Well, n- sometimes... I had an appointment with, um, a gastroenterologist. I'm not going to go into details, but it's <laughs> too, it's far too mucky. Um, but I had an appointment with a gastroenterologist recently and she was, um, in Francis's and she was Romanian um, and her, her French was not perfect, uh, and all the textbooks, all the all the gastro textbooks are in her office were in English. Um, one of them was called Failed Reflux Therapy, which seems like an odd <laughs> textbook to have. Can, can you get one which has good news? Failed Reflux Therapy. <laughs> Who wrote that book? Look up, not down. <laughs> Here are all the things that you shouldn't do, okay? You should probably start by so, reading this. So bizarre. Yeah. And on her desk, she even had a box of After Eight Mints, which is such a very English box of chocolates. It's a very Christmas-related yeah. box of chocolates. Yeah. So it's clear that she spoke English. And her French wasn't great, and my French isn't great. So, we, but we both battled through, yeah. like like it was a war that we had to see through to the end. Because the the person who switches to English first is the is the loser. It's the loser, yeah. It's and the I, loser. so I am I am oh, no. such a loser because now actually I'm not a loser because they always speak switch to English and then I'm like okay you can walk away from that going well if you don't want me to use my fluent French that's you want to learn that's fine so the joke I always say and I've said it many times is um, my French is not going very well but my excuses uh, are getting better all the time (laughs) I'm fluent (laughs) in excuses that's very good um okay well look i could talk to you for ages but um we have to stop at some point it's been an hour and 15 minutes thank you ian thank you coming back on the podcast um for the first time in about three and a half years was it it was pre-brexit wasn't it three and a half years ago pre-brexit we talked about it a little bit but yeah i think i was more optimistic about it then should we just not talk about it i think it's best not to now now i'm french i really don't have to have these worries anymore yeah but it's still a disappointment isn't it <sighs> it's like this it, it is it's it, there's there's one other thing and I'll, I'll just say this briefly about it in the, when i was in one of the interviews i had for my nationality thing one of the questions is how french do you feel you know and basically you've got to then come out with a spiel about very french. you know i look i wear onions around my neck on any weekday when i'm not working but i and i just and i just felt maybe maybe this is me being honest and it actually working for a change i just said i feel european um and i feel more european than i do british and i think that the values of europe are the values that were taken from the rights of man and from from the french revolution and in that respect I feel more French yeah. than I do English or British. Yeah, and, but, it, yeah. And, 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 and it worked, you know. I didn't try and go in there and go, look, I am so French. <laughs> I mean, look at me. <laughs> look, look at this tweed <laughs> frock coat I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, it's very nice to have you back on the podcast. And uh, next you. time you're in town, let me know and we'll go for a pint and Definitely. a podcast again. Definitely. Yeah, okay. A pleasure. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Okay, so that was Ian Moore. Thank you again to Ian for being on the podcast. I won't talk a lot more here at the end because I don't want the episode to be too long, but I would like to say thanks again to Ian for being on the podcast. You can find out more about Ian on his website, ianmoore.info. And well done for managing to follow this entire conversation. I wonder how much you understood, how many little jokes and funny moments you picked up on. It might be worth listening again, and I wouldn't be surprised if the transcription team chose to transcribe this episode like they did with episodes 382 and 383. You can find those transcriptions in the Google Documents by clicking transcripts in the menu on my website. Also, on my website, you might see the word premium in the menu, and I highly recommend you click on that and consider signing up to get access to all of the premium content I've made. And there's over 70 episodes of content, either video or 
or audio, and also all the new content that comes out regularly. Grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation lessons, PDFs that you can download, uh, practice drills, tests, memory tests, and all sorts of other things. So that's it for now then. Have a fantastic day, morning, lunch, afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, mid-evening, late evening, and night. And I will speak to you again on the podcast soon. But for now, goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.